Okay. Uh, looks like it's time to get started. Uh, before I, I begin, can everybody let me know if you can hear me? You can just type a Y into either the chat box or the question box. Okay. All right. Let's get started. So today we're going to talk about modifying a covered call strategy for commodities. Uh, almost everyone on the planet is familiar with the covered call strategy when it comes to stocks. And sometimes they assume that you, you can simply just apply the same idea to commodities, but it's not quite that simple. Uh, we're going to give you some, some tips and tricks on uh, how possibly you could do that with a commodity account and, and what that entails. But uh, really the, the biggest difference that we're going to talk about today is, is the leverage that's involved and obviously the risk that comes with that leverage. So if you're not uh, aware, of, if you've never been to one of my classes or you don't know who I am, my name is Carly Garner and I am a commodity broker, a futures and options broker at the Carly Trading. Uh, we're located in Las Vegas, Nevada, believe it or not, and, um, you know, it's fitting. Vegas is a gambling town, and guess what? Commodity trading can be gambling for those that are, or it, I shouldn't make it say gambling, it can be similar to gambling for, for those that aren't properly managing their risks. Uh, unfortunately, that's that's a lot of people that, that don't do that, but we're going to show you a couple of ways to uh, reduce the risk using options and turn it into more of an investment style strategy as opposed to um, highly speculative, although it obviously is speculation. So if you have any questions, comments, or concerns about anything that you hear about today, you can uh, contact me by email or you can give me a call. There's my phone number. Also, feel free to browse our website, decarlytrading.com. Um, again, we are a brokerage service. That's what we do. That's how we make our living. But uh, the uh, the website itself does have a lot of educational material, free videos, free articles. The idea is we want people to learn be and understand what they're getting into before they actually put their money on the line. Uh, somebody's saying that they can't see the video. Um, it's showing up properly on, on my screen. I'm logged in on a different computer. So I apologize for that, Vladimir. Uh, try closing it out and opening it back up. Hopefully it'll it'll work correctly for you. I apologize. Uh, but it, you should be seeing, definitely be seeing a video screen. Um, if you are on social media, check us out on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Just type in DeCarly Trading or even Carly Garner and we'll come up. It, on Twitter, my handle is at Carly Garner. And uh, I've already mentioned that I'm a commodity broker, but I'm also a strategist and an author. I write a monthly column for Stocks and Commodities Magazine. I also write a couple of newsletters for our brokerage clients. So brokerage clients of ours do get a free uh, subscription to our the newsletters that I write in-house. I've written four books on commodities. The latest is titled Higher Probability Commodity Trading. And uh, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears went into this book. We're really proud of it. It's, it was definitely a project. Um, if you're interested in learning more, you can check out the website. It's higherprobabilitycommoditytradingbook.com. It's on Amazon. That's going to be the cheapest place to get it. Um, and the book really covers every, anything you need to know about the commodity markets. It's probably going to be mentioned in there. We talk about seasonal analysis, technical analysis, fundamental analysis. We talk about putting a strategy together. We talk about managed futures. Uh, we talk about algo trading and tr trading and day trading. So it's a little bit of everything, and I went out of my way, and I actually made it a point to cover material and put the material in a different perspective, something other than what you could read on the internet or any other book. So I really think it's unique, and hopefully you do too. So again, Amazon.com is the best place to, to find the book, Higher Probability Commodity Trading. All right, so let's get started into uh, to talking about you know what we're here for today. Um, before I do that, one more thing, there is a substantial risk of loss in trading futures and options. It's not suitable for everybody. It is risky business. Okay, uh, first we're gonna just talk about the basics really quick just to make sure everybody fully understands what we're talking about here. Um, so basically, first of all, what is a futures contract? A futures contract is a contractual agreement to make or take delivery of a standardized quantity and grade of an underlying asset at a specific price and time in the future. That's a mouthful. What it really means is um, when we are trading crude oil futures, we are trading liabilities 
not assets. It's an agreement. It's not an asset. So for instance, if we bought crude oil today, let's say we buy a December crude oil future today and we'll just assume the price is $44 a barrel. Um, what we're agreeing to as a buyer of that futures contract at 44 is we're agreeing to take delivery or accept crude oil in December for $40 a barrel. And the exchange basically standardized the gra standardizes the grade of oil um, and that sort of thing. So it's, it's specific, it's, I'm sorry, it's not specific to the buyer or the seller, it's a standardized product. So all futures contracts are exactly equal when it comes to the specifications. It's a little different than if you were trading in the cash market, you might do a forward contract in which two individuals basically uh, determine the details. This isn't the case. Everything is exchange traded on, in the futures market and it's all identical. So uh, with that said, of course, speculators, which is 99% of the market, really don't ever take delivery of the crude oil. They're just speculating on the price. So if we're buying in today, if we're buying crude at 44 today, we are basically saying that we think in December crude oil is going to be trading higher than 44 maybe 45, maybe 46, maybe 4401, uh, you know, that to be determined, but ideally we want crude to be higher. Of course, if it doesn't go higher, then we're losing money on that liability because for us to offset our liability, which is our obligation to accept delivery of the crude oil, we have to sell that contract. So hopefully we're selling it above 44, not below 44. So that's basically futures trading in a nutshell. The thing you need to know about futures trading is there's leverage. Exchanges require very little margin to benefit or suffer from asset values, which are typically much higher than the funds on deposit. So for example, we'll stick with crude oil. The margin on crude oil right now is about $4,000. I'm just going to round to keep things simple. So it's about $4,000. If you have a $4,000 in your trading account, you can buy one crude oil future. Well, if we're assuming crude oil is valued at $44 per barrel, that means that one futures contract actually represents $44,000. And that's because uh, each contract is worth, uh, basically each point in crude oil is worth 1000 bucks. So if the contract's trading at $44, the total contract value is $44,000. If crude oil was at 100 dollars, the contract value would be $100,000. Now, of course, the margin would be higher. If crude oil was trading at $100,000, uh, the, the margin would probably be somewhere about eight or 9000 or at least that's what it was you know, back in the days when crude oil traded up there. But the point I'm trying to make is it's highly leveraged. So you can imagine if you had a $4,000 account and you bought one crude oil future, you're going to make or lose $1,000 for every dollar that crude moves. If crude goes to 45 and you're long, you made 1000 If crude goes to 43 and you're long, you lost 1000 So that's leverage, folks. That's how fast you can make or lose money in commodities. Now, you don't have to use the exchange's leverage. You can overfund your account and reduce the leverage. In fact, if you put $44,000 in your account and you bought crude oil at $44 a barrel, you basically aren't using any leverage at all because you are fully funding that speculation. So before we could talk about covered calls, we also have to ask ourselves what is a short option. And most of you probably know this, or you, you, you might not be in this class if you didn't, but let's just make sure that we're all on the same page. So if a trader sells a call, it's a bearish position. Call writers, when you're selling an option, you can, it's also call, uh, referred to as writing an option. Call writers receive an income, which is an option premium, in return for the liability of honoring the option buyer's right to buy the futures contract at the strike price. Okay, what this means is, let's assume that we buy crude at $44 a barrel, and to hedge that position, we might sell a call option at 46 our long futures contract is bullish, but our short call option is bearish. And when we sell that 46 call option, we're going to collect money to take that position. Let's just assume we collect $2,000. So we collect $2,000 for our option. That gives us a buffer underneath our futures contract of $2,000. But what, the, what selling the call does is it basically obligates us to deliver a futures contract to the buyer of the call if crude is above 46. 
So if crude oil goes to $47, we will be assigned the short futures from 46, which obviously will be losing money. Um, but we collected enough money to, to cover that. So that's the idea. If you're selling a call, it's a bearish pr proposition. If you're selling a put, it's a bullish proposition. And if you're trading futures around those, those options, then um, you're, and you're doing it antagonistically, then you're actually putting yourself in a situation where your, your position is hedged and you're bringing in some, in some income. And the reason you might want to do this is because options are an eroding liability. They basically lose value as time goes on, assuming that the market's not moving anywhere. Of course, if the market does move against you and it does move against your short option, then the option will increase in value. We're going to take a look at some examples that will help you to understand this concept a, a lot easier than, than just simply reading a slide and, and trying to determine the words. I know I'm a, a hands-on learner and I'm a visual learner, and so I'm assuming most people are. So now that we kind of have a, ba have a basic idea of what a futures contract is and what a short option is, let's talk about what is a covered call strategy. Trading covered calls include the purchase of an underlying instrument and the sale of a call option against it. Now you could also do the opposite. You could sell a futures contract and then sell a put, but in this case we'll just keep it simple. We're buying a futures contract and then we're selling a call. The short calls are anticipated antagonistic, which means they hedge the primary long position. They also provide income, so it's an income strategy. The short call reduces the risk of the primary position, so your primary position is the futures contract. If you're buying a futures contract and then selling a call, you really want the market to go up. Even though you sold a call that will lose money as the market goes up, you're going to be making more money on your long future than you'll be losing on your short call, so the idea is the long futures contract is your primary position. You are bullish, and you're taking a bearish position in the option market to hedge your bullish futures position. So the net result is it reduces the overall risk of the primary position. The opportunity cost of hedging yourself is you're limiting your profit potential of the prime. So in theory, if you bought a futures contract without trading any options around it, you have theoretically unlimited profit potential. If crude goes from $44 to $100 or to $150, you stand to make a lot of money. Uh, I mean, just in case you're interested, from $44 to $100, we're talking uh, $56,000. Now, I'm not saying that that's going to happen, but some futures traders just like the idea of knowing that there really no, there's no limit to how good the trade can eventually be. Uh, an option trader or somebody that's trading a covered call is willing to give up that unlimited profit potential because they know that the odds of something like that happening are slim. It's not impossible, but it's slim. So what they're doing is they are willing to sell that dream to somebody else, collect the premium, and hedge their trade. Okay, so most people consider covered calls and puts to be a conservative investment strategy. And that's due to the income potential and the inherent hedge of the risk built into the strategy. Um, and, and mostly it comes from the idea that in the world of stock trading, covered calls is probably relatively conservative because most people are long the stock market in general anyway in their retirement accounts or even in their investment accounts. Most people have exposures to stocks. Most people are diversified. And most people have a long time horizon. So the risk of being a stock investor isn't um, necessarily as, as large as it is being a commodity investor. And, and another big difference, like we've already discussed, is the leverage. Stocks don't have leverage. So in stocks, covered calls probably is a, con a conservative investment strategy. But when you're dealing with leveraged futures contracts as opposed to equities, the risks are elevated. And it can no longer be categorized as an investment. It's a trade. There's a big difference between an investment and a trade. And I'm not saying you shouldn't do one or the other, or one's better than the other. They're just different, and you have to understand if you're speculating and trading, you should be using risk capital, which is uh, risk capital is basically money that you can afford to lose without changing your lifestyle, because things do happen. If you're trading on leverage and you're trading aggressively, sometimes you're going to have a bad day. And so you want to make sure that you're trading within your means so that, number one, you're not going to 
ruin your, your financial situation. And number two, mentally you're going to be capable of making good trading decisions. If you're pushing things too far and you're taking too much risk, you're probably not going to be able to make those good decisions. You're going to panic and liquidate at the wrong time, or you're going to make uh, other poor decisions that cost you a lot of money. So even though trading cover calls and commodities isn't necessarily a convert conservative investment, it is relatively conservative in comparison to trading futures outright or selling options outright. Uh, and in my opinion, in many cases, it's actually a pretty attractive way to, to go about playing the market because it does give you a hedge, it does lower your risk, it does increase your odds of success because you're giving yourself more room for error. So basically, a cover call is combining a long future and a short option. It's a strategy in which a trader is long the underlying asset and also short a call option. And again, we mentioned that those two positions work against each other as the market goes up. Your futures contract making money, and your call options probably losing money, depending on how fast the time value is eroding and things like that. A covered call is a bullish stance in the futures market and a bearish stance in options. But generally, overall, it's a bullish trade because you want to make money on your future and your options just there to hedge or provide income. The nice thing about covered calls or covered puts is the even though a covered call is a bullish strategy, the market doesn't necessarily have to go up for you to make money. In fact, you can make money if the market goes up, down, or sideways. Where you lose money is if the market drops too far. So if you're really wrong, you lose money. If you're kind of wrong, you might make money. And if you're not wrong or right, it's neutral. You actually make good money. If the market goes in the direction you intend, then that's the best case scenario, obviously, and you might make quite a bit of money. The risk of a covered call is on the downside. If the market, if the bottom of the market falls out, you really don't have a whole lot protecting you. Once the short option starts losing a lot of value, your hedge diminishes on the way down. So a traditional version of a covered call is a one for one. You're buying one future and you're selling one call option. So a covered put is the exact same thing. All of the same char characteristics we just mentioned for a covered call apply to a covered put except for a covered put trader is selling a futures contract. You remember, in commodities, you can buy or sell in any order. You don't have to own the stock as you would in a stock account. You'd have to own the shares or borrow the shares and then maybe even pay interest for them. Actually, probably you would have to pay interest for them. In commodities, it's really simple. You don't have to borrow anything. You don't have to pay any interest. You just sell it. If you think it's going down, you sell it. And then eventually, you're going to have to buy it back later. So. In commodities, you could sell the futures contract and then sell a put, just like you would a covered call in stocks. It's the same idea. But of course, in, in, with a covered put, the risk is on the upside. So if the market trades sideways or goes lower, you make money. If the market rallies, you might make money, depending on how far it rallies. But if it rallies too much, if you're too wrong, that's where you get into trouble. So why would anybody want to do a covered call if you're giving up unlimited profit potential. Well, the truth is markets usually don't move in one direction, and it's very rare for people to catch really big moves in the futures markets. In fact, uh, generally speaking, markets tend to trade sideways. So options are an eroding asset. It's similar to buying a car and watching its value drop as you drive off the lot. All else being equal, options lose value with every minute that passes, and I'm not kidding when I say minute. If you've ever bought an option before and watched the quote screen, you will see that option lose value. If the market's really not going anywhere, your option will literally lose a few points every single day or every minute that passes. OK, we do have a question. Somebody's asking, uh, so in other words, there's no underlying stock involved in this transaction, so it's not really a covered call as we know it. Rather, it's a combined instrument similar to spreads. Um, not necessarily. It, it is a covered call. The, the idea is exactly the same. The only difference is leverage. So when, you are in, uh, when you're buying a futures contract, it's similar to buying this underlying stock because you're expecting that to appreciate in value. The difference is it's, it, it's done on leverage. And so it's a little riskier. Um, but it, it's the same general idea. It is, it's not really a spread. It is uh, actually a, a covered call. You want the, you're bullish. You want the market to go up. So it's the same general idea, just slightly different characteristics of the underlying asset, I guess. 
So the idea of wanting to trade covered calls is that anywhere from 70 to 90% of options expire worthless. I like to look at long options as lottery tickets. I know that's not really a popular viewpoint, but that's really what they are. Uh, you pay a small amount of money, or it might be a large amount of money, but you're paying a limited amount of money with the hopes of a specific event occurring and for you to actually make a lot of money. More often than not, you're going to lose money. It sounds like a lottery to me. So most options expire worthless, which is why it's appealing to be a seller. As an option seller, you're probably going to see 70 to 90 percent, give or take, of the options expire worthless, which means the option seller is going to make money most of the time and the option buyer is usually going to lose. Covered calls basically give traders ample room for error. Nobody's perfect. I mean, I know we all look at charts and we try to pick tops and bottoms and we try to estimate where the market might be going, but the reality is we don't have a crystal ball. We don't know exactly where it's going tomorrow. We can guess, but we might be wrong. So the idea is the more room for error you give yourself, the better your odds of success are going to be and the less stressful it's going to be. And that goes a long way. The less stress you're under, the more uh, the better decision maker you're going to be. Okay, somebody's asking if you should be selling in the money options or out of the money or at the money. Uh, it's a personal choice, depending on how aggressive you want to get. Um, generally speaking, and we're going to go over a couple of examples, generally speaking, I think you're better off going close to the money or a little out of the money. I, I wouldn't recommend doing in the money options because in the commodity world, in the money options have wider bid-ask spreads. They're not nearly as liquid. And so it makes it a little more difficult to get in and out of them. Um, so you'd be leaving money on the table just simply in the bid-ask spread, which is a hidden transaction cost. So um, depending on the market and the situation, generally you're going to want to go at the money or a little out of the money, and we'll talk about that. So why are covered calls and commodities different? We already talked about leverage. And the reason this makes a big difference is unlike stocks, um, the premium that you're collecting for that short option is not nearly as meaningful as it would be in stocks. In other words, uh, the hedging benefit of a short call or put against a primary long or short futures contract is minimal, unless the options are sold in a, sold in a higher quantity or right at the money. For instance, a stock trader could sell a call against 100 shares of stock for $300 and feel comfortable. Uh, depending on the stock, like let's assume that it's a $10 stock, you know, the market would have to drop quite a bit for, you, for your hedge, the $300 you collected, to, to run out. A $300 premium collection for a futures trader, on the other hand, would provide very little hedge and very little comfort. In fact, uh, it really wouldn't do much for you at all. The average, I mean, the E-mini S&P today moved 30 points, which is like 1500 bucks per contract. So that's just one day. If you sold an option for three, four, or 500 bucks, it's really not going to give you that much protection. So in futures, you can't do the traditional formula of selling an out-of-the-money call. You have to go either closer to the money, in fact, maybe even at the money, is in some cases, or you have to sell more than one for every futures you buy. We're going to talk about that again in a few slides. But I just wanted to point something out uh, in case some of you hadn't really thought about it. I mean, it's obvious and we all know it, but sometimes we just don't think of these things as we're putting our trades together. Uh, basically, commodities trade sideways. That's very different than what we see in the stock market. The stock market um, generally trades with an upward bias because of dividends and earnings growth. Um, and so it gives co the covered call traders a lot higher probabilities than commodity traders when it comes to strictly you know, comparing the two covered call strategies. And the reason being, if, if a covered call strategy in stocks goes wrong, the market sells off, you know that eventually, if you hang on to that pool of stocks for long enough, it'll probably come back for you. It always has throughout the history of time. But as a commodity trader, it's not quite that easy. Commodities tend to trade in a range. It's a very big range, and it can be volatile, and it can be fast, but it is a range. They generally don't trade in an uptrend like stocks do. 
inflation does work in favor of commodity prices, but there's no dividends or no earnings growth that keep them in an incline. So because of these two differences, the leverage and just the fact that stocks always go up and commodities generally go sideways, the traditional model of a covered call strategy is not ideal. Stock traders sell deep out of the money calls for additional income to provide a small hedge, but that's not enough for futures traders. Commodity traders must collect more premium for more covered calls to make sense. In other words, we need a, in commodities, we need a bigger hedge. Selling out of the money options probably isn't going to do it. So there's two ways to get more premium to make a covered call strategy worth it, and that is quantity and distance. For, for instance, you could sell two calls for every long futures contract, or you could sell a closer to the money call and do it in a one-by-one -one ratio, just like you would your stock account. So let's, let's take a look at doing a ratio, meaning selling more than one per futures contract, and seeing how you would determine how many. If a covered call strategy involve, involves selling out of the money call options in higher quantities, you have to determine how many to sell. To do this, you need, really need to understand or be aware of really how bullish you are, where you think the market's going, where's your profit targets, or at least where's your uh, the expectations of, of that particular commodity, where do you think it's going? And then from there, you use delta to determine the ratio quantity. If you're not familiar with delta, delta is simply the rate of change in an option relative to futures contract movement. So for example, if the delta of a particular commodity option is 40, it implies if the futures market moves 10 points, the option will move four points. So you can see it's kind of like a percentage. It's a percentage of how much the option will react to the futures market price change. A lower delta equals lower risk and vice versa. So if you are super bullish, you'd probably go with a higher delta. If you're slightly bullish, you might go with a lower delta because those are, again, uh, lower risk and higher risk. Delta is kind of synonymous. So for example, if you're neutral, you really don't have a directional bias, but you think that the options are overpriced because maybe the implied volatility is high, or there's some sort of news announcement that's keeping the option pricing high, and you really just want to collect premium. This is one way to do it. So if you want a delta neutral trade, you could sell two at the money options, and the reason I say this is an at the money option generally has a delta of 50, meaning it's going to move about half as fast as the futures contract moves. Now keep in mind the futures contract has a delta of 1, and that's always going to be the case. Futures will always have a delta of 1 because it is, you know, it is the futures contract. It's, of course, if the futures goes up, the futures is going to go up the same amount. So it's simple. So anyway, if, you're, if you want to be neutral, you could do it a couple of ways. You could sell two at-the-money calls. You could sell three out-of-the-money calls with a delta of 30. You could sell four out-of-the-money calls with a delta of 25. Now you can see the net result of all of those trades is going to be a, a neutral position. But that doesn't necessarily mean they have the same risks. In fact, I would probably say that the delta... 25 options in a higher quantity is going to be a lot riskier than selling two at the money options. And the reason being, if if the market takes off sharply to the upside, you're really going to be in a lot of trouble on those on those options. Um, generally, if the market goes up moderately or trades sideways, you're going to do very well. But if you're if the market goes up too far, you're going to have a lot of risk exposure. In fact, a lot more risk exposure than you would have by selling two at the money options. Because you have to keep in mind, the at-the-money options are going to be a lot more expensive. They're going to have a lot more time value built into them. So your posi position will actually move quite a bit slower if you're doing a 1 by 2 as, you, as opposed to doing a 1 by 4 Somebody's asking, um, what would you do in non-volatile -vol times? Well, if, if the market volatility is really low, and uh, when I say really low, I'm talking like maybe... For example, in the in the S and P, the VIX and, and implied volatility were at the lowest they had been in in a couple of years, just a few weeks ago. That 
when the volatility is that low, you probably don't want to be an option seller. You probably don't want to do covered calls or covered puts. You probably want to maybe just buy some cheap options and, and hope you're on the right side of the trade. Um, but every situation is different. Generally, though, if the if the volume, I'm sorry, the volatility is low, you probably don't want to have an option selling strategy, and and that's what this is. Covered calls and puts are option selling strategies. So if you are bullish in a particular market, you might want to sell a, an option with a delta of 50, call option with a delta of 50, and then buy a futures contract. I have the word optimal and a question mark after this because everybody has a different opinion. Um, on what's going to work better for them and, and their market outlook and that sort of thing. But in my opinion, doing a one-for-one one with an at-the-money option is probably your best bet. It's going to give you the best hedge, you're going to collect the most premium, and it's going to be the least stressful trade. That particular position would have a delta of 50 because your futures delta is 1, you're selling a call option with a delta of 50, which is actually a negative 50, and then they net out to be 50. So the position itself is really going to go up or down about half as much as the futures contract alone would. So it's just a slower way to play. But some people that are bullish like to give the futures market room to move, and they want to squeeze out a little more profit potential on the futures contract. So they might sell two out-of-the-money options with a delta of 30. Or they might go with deep out-of-the-money options with a delta of 25 and sell two or three of them, depending on how aggressive they are. When you do that sort of thing, your profit potential explodes because you're going to make money all the way from your futures contract entry to the strike price of the short options. Above the strike price of the short options is where you start to have to consider your risk on the upside. And we're going to look at a few examples. But it... Uh, when you do sell the deep out of the monies or the out of the monies, you're, you're really uh, taking on quite a bit of risk because not only do you have unlimited risk on the downside, but you also have unlimited risk on the upside. If you're doing a one-by-one, one, there is no unlimited risk on the upside. You only have downside risk, which is hedged nicely by your short call. But if the market goes up, regardless of how high it goes up, if crude went to 100, you'd still make the same amount of money. You'd get to keep the premium you've collected, and that's it. So before we take a look at some specific examples, let's just talk about the advantages and the disadvantages. The advantages of using ratio covered calls is there's large profit potential, and there can be a substantial hedge if you're selling more calls than you're buying futures. Also, it lowers the position delta and it lowers your risk at the moment, at that moment. But if volatility changes and suddenly the futures market runs to your strike prices, then honestly at that point it actually becomes very risky. So rate, you want to be really careful if you're going to do ratio covered calls because they can come back to bite you. If volatility increases while you're in the trade and it does so in the wrong direction, it can be extremely expensive. The disadvantages of a ratio is there's risk on both sides of the market. If the commodity is beyond the strike price at expiration, you might be losing more on the options than you're making on the futures. So in other words, if you're too right, you might lose money. And the other side of that coin is if the market falls sharply or the bottom falls out, the strategy really, um, it fails. So if you're doing a ratio covered call, again, the market trades sideways or moves slightly higher, you're in good shape. But if it, if it moves in a volatile manner in either direction, you're going to lose a lot of money. Okay, so let's talk about a one-by-one one covered call, which I tend to think is the most uh, reasonable way to go about it. And that is, again, in my opinion, I think if you sell an at-the-money call and then buy a, a future, I think that's going to give you the best odds of success. The advantages are, there's a large profit potential, even if the direction is only slightly accurate. So you don't have to be necessarily right. You just don't have to be wrong, and you make some money. It gives you a substantial hedge. It lowers your position delta a heck of a lot more than trading the futures outright. And in a lot of cases, it'll be lower than uh, using multiple options to get into a delta neutral, because things can change, and your delta will change day by day. That's another thing I should point out. 
the delta of a position or the delta of an option, it's just a snapshot. That's what it is right now at this second, but that doesn't mean that it's always going to be that way. As the futures market moves, the delta is moving. So sometimes you have to play catch up. If you're dealing with multiple options, it becomes difficult to keep up with it. The advantage of selling a one by one and using an at the money option is you only have risk on one side of the market. You have higher probability of success if the direction of speculation is is anywhere but you know, if it's remotely correct, you're going to make a little money. And it works higher, I'm sorry, it works in a grind higher and a sharp rally. What a lot of people don't realize is if you're selling a one by one covered call, you get to keep all of the premium if the futures market is above your strike price at expiration. So don't worry about selling an at the money call if you think the market, the futures contract is going to be above the strike price of your call option, then that's a beautiful thing. You get to keep all the money. Regardless of how high it goes, you still keep all the money. The downside is you're giving up, you know, you're capping your profit potential, but at least you know going in that if the market trades sideways or higher, even by a tick, you're going to make all that premium that you collected. So the disadvantage of a one by one uh, covered call is if the bottom falls out. If you're dead wrong about the market being bullish, and in fact, crashes or even just falls sharply, you're, you'll be hedged to, to a certain degree. Your short option will keep up with the long futures for a little while, but eventually that hedge will run out and you're going to be basically naked of futures contracts. So here's a couple of rules of thumb to just keep in mind. Ratio covered calls are generally best when used in a market that's trending in the direction of the short call. And the reason being, this is when the options are more attractively priced and it provides a better hedge. It also mitigates the risk of the market running away on the upside, causing massive losses on the short calls. So in other words, if you are going to do ratios and you understand that there is upside risk, if you buy a future and sell two calls or three calls or whatever it is and the market rallies too far, you're going to be losing money and you're going to be losing a lot of money. So to decrease the odds of that happening, if you're going to do ratios, do it when the market's already expensive. Do it when the market you think maybe the market's peaking or maybe not peaking, but in the middle of a trend, uh, not in a low. So if you think the, for example, soybeans right now are at a two or three year low, you probably don't want to do ratio cover calls in that market because when beans do turn around, they have the propensity to move really far, really fast, and that's exactly what's going to get you in trouble on a ratio covered call. So you want to do it when the trend is somewhere middle of the road, not necessarily when you think it's exhausting, but not necessarily when it's just starting out either. Because you remember, you have risk on both sides of the market when you're doing a ratio. So you want to give yourself room on both sides. So one by one covered calls are typically best used if you're seeking a trend reversal or mid-trend. When a market is meaningfully oversold and the odds of a futures market recovery are high, a one for one call is attractive. So for instance, We'll go back to soybeans. Soybeans are, seem to be pretty cheap around the 950 area. So one way to play that might be to go along a futures contract and then sell a call option at the money. Uh, I haven't priced out the options, but soybean options tend to be expensive. So I would assume you could probably get you know, $1,500 to $2,000 if you go out to, to January or March. And so if, if beans do turn around and rally, you get to keep that $1,500 or $2,000 that we hypothetically collected on that option and uh, should be relatively stress-free, assuming we're right about beans going up. But if you were uh, taking the opposite end of that story, beans being cheap right now, this would not be the time to sell a covered put because if you sell a futures contract and then you sell a put at the money, but the market rallies, the benefit that you're receiving from the short put, the hedge, is only going to cover you some for so far, so you don't want to do that when a trend's exhausting. So let's take a look at a few quick examples. So a bullish oil trader might go along a futures contract at $44 and sell a $44 call option for $2.50 in premium. In real money, that equates to $2,500. bucks. So a futures trader would be collecting $2,500. The result of the trade is that the trader makes money as long as the price of oil is below is above 41.50 at expiration. And that's because he's buying it at 44, 
the premium he collects hedges him down to 41 and a half at expiration. If crude oil goes up, as he expects, he gets to keep that entire 2,500 bucks. And it doesn't matter, crude can be at 4401, crude can be at 4450, crude can be at $48 a barrel. He still gets to keep the 250 in premium, the 2,500 bucks, no matter what. So that's, uh, the nice thing is, even if he's only slightly right and crude's at 4401, he still gets to keep the 2,500 bucks. But if he's really right and crude goes to 50 bucks, a futures trader would have made $6,000 and this particular trade would only make $2,500. But the idea is a futures trader wouldn't have any sort of hedge. A futures trader wouldn't have the opportunity to make money even if he's not necessarily right, if the market goes sideways. So this is just a way to increase your odds of success, lower your risk, and hopefully keep your emotions in check. So somebody is asking uh, which Greeks you should pay attention to. The thing about the Greeks are, again, with Delta or any of the other Greeks, they are a snapshot. They're going to tell us what today's situation is, in fact, what this minute situation is, but markets move fast and they can change fast. I see a lot of people that, um, you know, they sell options, so they're looking at the theta and all these things and they get excited because they just assume that everything's going to work out according to what their Greek calculations tell them, but that's just not how markets work. Markets change quickly, they're dynamic, um, just because your theta says you're going to make this much money in a week from now doesn't mean that's going to be the case. Things change fast. I've seen options that have a delta of 10 or 20 percent that seem to be almost worthless and almost no risk, and I've seen them come to life and absolutely crush trading accounts. So you just have to be careful. You don't want to get sucked into assuming that anything that the Greek calculations tell you today is going to be a long-term situation because it's not. That said, I'm not saying you shouldn't look at them. You should peek at them, keep, be aware of them, but uh, just be careful how much faith you put into them because they're not telling you what's going to happen. They're telling you what is happening right at the moment. Okay, so this is a, a similar trade. This is a trader that does trading bonds. Hi, this is a hypothetical position. I'm just an example. Um, this trader would be buying a futures contract at 158 in the 30-year bond and selling a 160 call. So this is a little different in that he's not selling an at-the-money call, he's selling an out-of-the-money call, which means he's going to collect a relatively a little more less premium, but he's going to open his profit potential up wider because if you're selling out-of-the-money options, you have an opportunity to make more money on your futures contract. So you're giving up a little bit of a hedge to make a little more on the futures. So if you're confident in your position and you're confident in your ability to, to speculate on price, this might be a way for you to go. This particular trade has a maximum profit of $4,000, and that occurs as long as the price of bonds are above 160. Again, they can be at 160.01, or they can be at 160 and a half, or they can be at 162 or 163. It doesn't matter. The trader is going to make $4,000 no matter what. As long as it gets to that strike, that price of 160, they get the maximum payout. Because this trader opted to sell an option that was a little out of the money as opposed to at the money, he's going to have a slightly smaller cushion on the downside. In this particular case, he can be wrong by two handles in the market before he really runs into risk at expiration. I don't know exactly what, if, if this trader would have sold an at the money option, which is a 158 call. I, you know, I don't have prices in front of me, but just kind of guessing based on how bond options are priced, he probably would have collected three to three and a half handles for it. So his profit potential would have been more like 3,000 instead of 4,000, but he would have had a bigger downside buffer. So you see how that works. You can, the great thing about trading is you can make your position as risky or as conservative as you want it to be based on how you design it. And of course that means uh, you know you have to be confident in your position to, to be able to do something like that. So gold is a good market to do covered calls or covered puts in. This particular example is a covered put. And the reason gold is a good market is because the premiums are really, really big. You can collect a lot of money. Now the downside to that is the gold market isn't, you know, it's not a charity. They're not giving you a lot of premium because they're nice. Options are priced that way because gold can be risky. There are times that gold moves $100 a day, and that's, that's a lot of money. 
when you're trading gold, you just have to keep in mind there is a reason they're giving you these big fat premiums. So don't overload your account. Keep in mind you need to make sure that you've got the wherewithal to write out some, some big moves if you're going to be in it for the long haul. The, one, the biggest mistake I see with people that, that trade gold is they're trying to trade gold in a in a smaller account and they, they're just not giving the market enough room to move. Unfortunately, a lot of them end up being right in, the, in their price speculation. They just can't hold on to the trade long enough to make money. So you see this uh, big spike in gold from somewhere around 1260 to 1360. That occurred in roughly, well, one day, one trading session. That's a daily bar. That move represents roughly $10,000. For, per contract. So you can see how fast this market moves. That's pretty rare. It doesn't happen every day, but it can happen. So again, that's why gold premiums are, are pretty fat. But in more, normal market conditions, gold might move five bucks a day, you know, maybe even less, maybe 10, maybe five. So, um, and to give you perspective, that's like 500 to 1,000 bucks a day. So in this position, uh, a bearish gold trader could dramatically increase the odds of success and selling a futures contract by also selling a put as a hedge. In this, position, in this particular example, this trader could have sold his hedge or his put for $5,000. And now keep in mind, this is an at-the-money option. So this trader is basically putting himself in a position to keep all of that $5,000 as long as gold is below 1370 which is his futures entry price. And again, it only has to be at 1369.9 for him to get all that money. It doesn't have to, to drop to 1200 or even 1350. If it's only $1 below his futures entry price, he gets to keep the entire five grand. And that five grand is equivalent to $50 in gold, just so you know. So the break even price would be 1420. So if this trader held the position to expiration, at 1420, he would be breaking even. It's hard to believe if you're wrong, $50 in gold, you'll still not lose money, but it's true. However, of course, if it goes above 1420, it's like being short a naked futures contract. Your hedge is no longer working for you, so you're, you're vulnerable. Now, of course, if those types of things happen, you can adjust. There's nothing that says you have to keep the trade exactly as it is to expiration. If you get into a trade, you sell gold, and then you sell your put, and bring in five thousand dollars, and gold goes up. If you're, if you think you're in danger of the market being above fourteen twenty at expiration, you can always buy your put back, take a profit on that, and then maybe a sell a put in a different month. You might go to December or something else. Try to keep it equivalent to the strike price because if you're selling a put with a higher strike price, you're going to eventually put yourself in a position where you can't make money because you're just uh, you're basically just locking in the loss on your futures contract, so you don't want to do that. But you might be able to buy back your October put and sell a December put and get yourself into the same general strategy but with more premium collected. Uh, here's another example of a ratio put. This is a covered ratio put. And you can see the profit diagram here on the right-hand side is a lot different because there is risk on both sides of the market. You have an unlimited risk zone if you're too right, and you also have one if you're too wrong. That's what makes trading ratios different. Now, the good thing is about trading ratios is markets generally don't move in big trends. They usually trade sideways or chop around, so more often than not, you probably get away with it, but all it takes is one big unexpected move to really cause you some, some pain if you're doing a covered ratio. But I wanted to make sure you understood the strategy and knew what it was, and and just, you know, you can decide for yourself whether it's something you want to participate in. But in this particular example, a trader would be selling an October futures contract, and this is in, uh, this is also in gold, and then selling three 1290 puts. Now, the delta on these 1290 puts at the time was 33, which means this is a delta neutral strategy. This trader is not necessarily bullish or bearish, although his position will make more money if the market goes down. In fact, it'll make a lot of money if the market goes down, but it's generally neutral. So if the market trades sideways, he still stands to make a, a good chunk of change. Because he's selling the 1290 puts and he's selling a future at 1320, he's gave, giving himself a chance to make $30 in the futures market. So that alone on the futures trade is 
$3,000. Then he's collecting the 1290 puts for $20 a piece. That's Two thousand a piece, and he's and he's selling three of them, so that's six grand right there. So his profit potential is nine thousand dollars. That's why people are tempted to do this, this sort of strategy. He gets to keep nine thousand dollars as long as gold is around the twelve ninety mark. If it's a little above twelve ninety or a little below twelve ninety, he's gonna make a little less. He'll make money. He'll make something all the way from thirteen eighty to twelve thirty, and that's a pretty big range. I think we can all agree gold probably would stay in, in that particular range. In fact, uh, this was charted a few months ago and gold's still in that range. So this trade would have been working very well, but it's not without its risks. I appreciate everybody coming out today. I hope that you learned a little something new. I know this is a lot of information. It's hard to cram into uh, an hour long presentation with, on a few slides and there, you know, we talked about some, um, aggressive strategies. So if you're interested in learning more in a lot more detail and a lot easier to understand probably in a better format, please consider picking up a copy of our book. It's Higher Probability Commodity Trading. You can get it on Amazon. It's, it's cheapest on Amazon. You can get it anywhere, but Amazon's probably the best. You can check out our website at higherprobabilitycommoditytradingbook.com. There's reviews. Uh, there's sample chapters. There's sample charts. All kinds of good stuff. Now, if, uh, if you're interested in any, anything else that we have to offer, we are a brokerage firm. Please be sure to visit us at decarlytrading.com. And if you have any questions whatsoever, uh, feel free to email me. Contact me on social media through Twitter, at Carly Garner, Facebook, Instagram. If, if any of you have any questions, um, at the moment that you can think of, you can type them into the question box, or if not, you can send me an email. I'd love to hear from you.